panelists Einar Karasan, Hannah Ostewick, Laura Lindstedt, Martin Gellin in conversation with Karen Peterson. This session is presented by Nordic Lights. Also wanted to say Laura and Hannah are going to be signing their books after the session at the book signing area of Darbar Hall, which is on your left. So you can go grab your books, you know, your copies from the bookstore. Thank you. There you go. Thank you for that kind introduction and hello everyone. It's wonderful with this uh, great interest in our panel. Um, my name is Karin Pettersson. I'm a Swedish um, journalist and editor and author and I will be uh, moderating this talk today. And um, the topic is gender equality in Scandinavia and the Nordics. And um, we will talk a lot about policies and um, and, and uh, strategies and what has led up to this. But since I'm here with a panel of fantastic authors from Iceland, Sweden, Finland, and Norway, I, I would like to start with a question about, which is more about um, identity and art. And um, one of the starting points for this discussion is that our countries have, in, within a couple of generations, transformed from fundament fundamentally very patri patriarchal societies to societies which are now always on the top of the lists of, of, of gender equality. And of course, this is a revolution in many ways that has happened very, very quickly and within a short period of time. And um, I would like to ask the, uh, the writers and the authors on stage how, how this, if they can, if they can try to uh, think about this, how, how this rapid transformation until the place where we are today have influenced your work, uh, really your writing. And um, Einar, maybe we should start with you. I, I know in your last book, you only almost have men <laughs> as protagonists, but um, can you try to answer my question? Yes, <clears throat> hello everyone. Um, uh, this uh, change that uh, we are talking about is, of course, influencing literature like uh, everything else. Uh, nowadays, it is, uh, you can say, not very politically correct to have only, only men in, a, in, a, in, a, in any context. It's okay if it's only women still. But, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, if, if you're going to make a film or a, or a novel or something, you will uh, try to uh, uh, reflect both genders and, uh, and uh, as much of variety as possible. But uh, my last book uh, takes place on an Icelandic trawler in the year 1959, so I am fairly ex excused for only having a, a, a male person, personnel since uh, there were only men working on trawlers at that time. But uh, throughout my career I have uh, had a lot of, lots of uh, main characters that are, are female and the most important. Thank you. Hanna, do you want to continue? Uh, I think the fact that I don't think about myself as a woman, uh, I think about myself as a writer, and I think only that shows how it is to be a young Norwegian writer. A young, young, I'm not, well, I'm almost 50. <laughs> well, that, uh, uh, how it is to be a, a, a female writer in Norway that I don't think of myself as female, but, uh, and I think that shows how this uh, evolution has really affected us. Um, but what I do in my novels, uh, because I think that, uh, I think still, even in Norway, uh, to be a woman is something else than being a man. But I am a woman inside this society, so I don't really overlook uh, what are the deep, what are the deep kind of structures in, in me being a woman in, in this society, I must also say that that is not the main topic of my novels. They are 
existential, but, uh, and I think ex existence is quite similar for all of us on that deep level, but, um, but uh, in my novels I always uh, have uh, a female protagonist as, as the center character, and I do that, I put in a woman, and then I don't think about anymore that she's a woman. Then I write my novel as I myself live my life. And then I think that the novel will kind of display some of the information uh, about how it is to be a woman in Norway today that I don't, I haven't put it in there because I thought that now I will put it in, this is what I think. But I think writing a novel kind of uh, from a woman's, uh, with a woman, per female, protagonist, but kind of forgetting that she's female, just writing. I think then the novel is bigger than my thoughts and that we can read out of that novel, that you here in India can read something out of my novel. Yes, please, give it to me. <laughs> it's coming. That you can kind of, yes, thank you, thank you. This is uh, the, my novel, Love, that you can kind of, when you read it, I think you can tell me something about how it is to be a woman in Norway that I could not tell you. Thank you. Laura? All right, um, I have written now two novels. Uh, first was about adoption and uh, about modernity, which, which was very difficult in this novel called Scissors in English. It had, has not been translated yet. And uh, of course, this is a very feminine theme. And the second one, Oneron, which came out 2015 in Finland, there is only female uh, main characters, uh, protagonists in this novel. So, um, and they are across the world, these seven women. So, uh, although I, I agree with you, Hanna, that uh, deep down inside, I think that we are all the same human beings. It doesn't differ if you are a man or a woman. We, for example, react through uh, mirror neurons to uh, empathic situation and so on. Uh, I still uh, choose my subjects uh, from the woman uh, subjects. So my forthcoming novel uh, will be out next month, and uh, there is again female protagonist. But uh, besides on writing, I do some uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, I give my face and my uh, in, in a, a, a advertising campaigns or welfare campaigns. Oh, well, this kind of, for example, uh, against domestic violence, which is a big problem in Finland, uh, and it's uh, mainly women who suffer from that. And now we are trying to change the rape law in Finland as well, that it wouldn't base on, uh, be based on violence, the, um, uh, how you consider rape, but on consent. And I do this kind of promotion in Finland, and it is because I'm an author, and I can use a little bit publicity through that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Martin, you are the only non-fiction uh, writer in this group. You're a journalist and, you, uh, and a non-fiction writer, and you have lived uh, abroad in the US for the last couple of decades, and you have this kind of outsider's look uh, or view uh, on, our, on Sweden and our societies. How how would you um, answer this question about uh, culture and identity and writing about uh, these issues from, from afar, so to speak? Right, yeah, I've, I've lived in New York for the past two decades and uh, re worked as a reporter all across the, the US. And um, I think, you know, I grew up in Sweden and I think I was very much shaped uh, by, by that uh, in, in my worldview. Um, and, uh, um, I've, you know, covering American politics um, for the last 10 years or so, it's very obvious how much gender shapes the political uh, currents in the country. Um, regardless if it was, you know, the last presidential election or, or the whole, I think the whole rise of right-wing uh, populism is in many ways, um, you know, a crisis of masculinity. Um, I think it's a bit of an underreported uh, uh, factor in the in the rise of nationalism and nativism is is a sort of male rage. Um, 
So, um, you know, the gender dynamics of America is very different from the gender dynamics of, of Sweden. Uh, Sweden is one of the most um, successfully e gender equal countries, even if there's still a, a way, way to go. Um, America is very far from that. So, uh, so it's, you know, it's, it has been very interesting to see the contrasts over the years. Um, so as, as we, we started out with saying that this is, has been a very rapid um, transformation of our societies and uh, my impression nowadays is when you look at the, uh, Scandinavia and we kind of often pat ourselves on the back saying you know we're the most gender equal societies in the world and so forth and we kind of take that for granted but it's as I said it's only been a couple of uh, generations, maybe one or two generations, even if, I mean, if we speak to our mothers and grandmothers, they s describe a, an entirely, of course, different, different society. And I think it's also important to remember that this, uh, where we are now, it's, it hasn't happened um, by itself. It's a result of struggle, political struggle. Uh, it's a result of organizing and, and it's really um, a result of women uh, organizing and going into politics and a, a kind of a combination of um, activism and parliamentary uh, very hard work. And, but thinking about the policies then that are uh, fundamental in creating this situation where we are now, um, some, of the, um, some of the policies often, most often talked about are um, uh, the general welfare systems, creating uh, kindergartens for all, um, also the tax system being based on individual uh, taxation instead of like, taxing the family as a whole. Um, it's about parental leave and so forth. Uh, w thinking about policy and policies and this struggle that we have, uh, that we are all a result of, so to speak, what would you th say is the most important piece of the puzzle uh, um, politically, because I think that might be interesting for this, uh, for this audience. Does anyone want to start? I'm, I, I know nothing about politics, so I cannot inform you, but, I, but I, I think the interesting thing is that I think all these factors kind of work together, that uh, all these structural uh, levels, that there are kindergarten, that also the working hours, in Scandinavian countries, you go to work at 8.30 and you finish at 4 or maybe 4.30. But I mean, you don't have this long lunch break where kids come home from school. Then you have to have someone at home, or blah, 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 blah. So it's kind of how is the society structured on a very practical level because, because this, this is everyday life. Uh, gender is everyday life. And then, of course, there are all these. But, but I think this, there are so many structural things, but then it's also, I mean, there are female writers in India too. There are not only, you know, suppressed women. How? How? So I think there are the structural level of the society, but then it's also the person, I mean, it's how you grow up and where do you learn to be free? Where do you learn to take possession of your own life? And is that a freedom you really have. Does your family and your upgrowing and the small society around you, your, uh, is there liberty there? And that goes even for the very inside question of writing. Am I free to write what I want to write? And where does that liberty come from? The government can't give you that liberty. Where does that come from? And I think that it also comes from parenting. I had a, a working mother. She was all, always, I mean, she, and she even left us when I was small to go to, to, she left my family when I was three years old to go to the other part of the country. She left her family and her kids to get an education. And of course, that was not uh, what a three-year-old girl uh, needed. But as a grown-up, I know that she took her life and, and, and worked on it uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, followed her needs. That, of course, gave me a freedom that she could never just, oh, you're free, honey, you can do whatever you want. No, that's only words. But she showed me in a very painful way that to strive for, for your freedom, that is something you have to do and it is possible. Thank you. Well, I think that I'm really a product of welfare state because I come from northern part of Finland, 
which is also called Hungerland, because we had a, a, this famine years, last one was 1868, and it really struck to my region. And we even have a national a province song, Song of a Hungry Land. So distances are very long, the winter is cold, there are no natural resources whatsoever. And it's a very beautiful place to be. But my grandpapa was a bus driver, among others. He didn't go to schools. My grandmother uh, was a telephone center, worked there in a telephone center. And she had three sisters, and only one could be sent to have education. My mother, grandmother would have loved to be a, a journalist. No, sorry, a lawyer. <laughs> but. Um, she couldn't do it, but there was very strong uh, appreciation toward education in my family. So my mother became teacher, and now I could go to the university. And one very important thing in Finland is that the university is free for everybody. You just have to be good to get in, but when you are in, you don't need to pay the huge amount of, of uh, fees to study there. So. That's very important. Uh, one single thing I think is important there. Martin, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think uh, all of the examples that you mentioned initially are, you know, have contributed to the to the relatively healthy state of of, of um, uh, gender equality in the Scandinavian countries. Um, Comparing to, to New York, where I live, uh, there is no... America is one of the very few countries in the world that doesn't have paid parental leave at all. Um, there's no guarantee of even a single week um, paid parental leave. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the burden of that is disproportionately placed on women. Um, I see that even among the most privileged and the most uh, progressive and liberal women in New York, they have to fight much harder to, to just be able to have a few months um, of parental leave. And when they return to work, their, their wages are suffering. Um, if they, if they try to take a year or two off, they, they return and they get uh, less pay than they had before. Um, and there's much less uh, uh, participation uh, for men. In, in, in raising children. Um, so, you know, I think that's one very clear example of how policies have shaped culture and how, uh, you know, legislation and hard fought elect political victories have um, led to the countries we have now. That's me. Uh, when I uh, think about the modern uh, times in uh, in uh, my country or in Scandinavia. I tend to look back on history. I'm, a, I'm an author of many historical novels, uh, among uh, others from uh, eight or uh, 1,000 years ago. And uh, when, when we look at our background, the Nordic countries, we, we can see we have a common background. And at that time, we had a common language. We were one nation, you can say. Uh, it was the, the Viking times. Iceland was settled by the Vikings uh, 1,100 years ago or so. And if you look at the Viking culture, uh, gender equality is not the first thing that will uh, come to your mind. But we have, uh, we have a literature, very old literature that we can refer to, like uh, very old poems, the Edda poems and so on. And then we have uh, written uh, books like the uh, Icelandic sagas, mainly from the 12th, 13th century. And you can see there that uh, it was very male dominated. But on the other hand, and that was maybe not very, not unusual at all, uh, you, saw, you can see a great respect for the women in, in these books. Uh, uh, one of the most respected settlers in Iceland, who settled a great part of the western part of Iceland, was a woman. And there is a whole book written about her, her settlement, and, uh, and uh, the story of her family afterwards. But throughout the centuries, it was 
male dominated. It was the men that were fighting, although very often they were sent to kill uh, someone else by a woman. Uh, I think that what has happened has mainly come, uh, where, uh, is mainly influenced from uh, abroad. Uh, things like gender equality, uh, such ideas, I think, root back to uh, maybe the French Revolution or uh, the uh, first American uh, constitution or, or uh, uh, declarations of independence uh, with sentences that are very uh, relevant today, maybe not least here in India, all men are born equal. Uh, then uh, uh, socialism has a lot to do with this and the left-wing political movements and then of course the, the women parties that are oft, uh, very often very related to this. An old friend of mine was one of the founders of, the, of a women's party that had a great success in the 1980s in Iceland. Later on she became the chairman of the uh, Social Democratic Party. So um, I think it's these things that are, are, are shaping this. And of course, when men realize that the women are in uh, many fields, may, maybe most fields, more clever and uh, to solve things, this comes naturally. Thank you. Um, so I'm interested in this uh, conflict between um, struggle and uh, the stories, the historical struggle on one hand and, and uh, the situation where we are now that we're kind of telling ourselves a story that these are, this is just the way our societies are. And uh, I have a background in, in politics myself and in, um, in social democratic po uh, politics. And when I talk to the, to the women who are uh, one generation older than me, than me, they would tell the stories of trying to organize uh, for women's rights within social, demo the, within social democracy, within the progressive movement, and being constantly uh, ridiculed and um, uh, contested and by the men in the same party. So, and that's just, you know, a couple, two or three de decades ago, there was this massive struggle, even within progressive uh, parties and movements in our countries where the men said, why should we, why should we put a lot of money on kindergarten? Why should we put, put a lot of money in uh, women's health uh, and so forth and so on? So, but now uh, my, ex my view or the way I see it, now there's this consensus story saying, you know, we're all for feminism and we're all for gender equality. And at the same time, it sometimes feels like we've reached a kind of an impasse. Uh, we still have really, we really have challenges when it comes to gender equality in our societies, but we're again at a place where the men would say, well, that's enough. You know, you had, we have so much gender equality already and now let's talk about other issues. Do you agree with this? Uh, are we at an impasse or are there still issues? Are we perfect, uh, perfectly equal societies? And if not, um, where, where do the challenges lie? Who wants to start? Laura? Um, kind of a leading question, maybe. Oh, yes. I think that uh, we are in a certain backlash now in, in Scandinavia as well. For example, empathy and understanding towards poor people has uh, reduced dramatically last year. And for example, in Finland, we do have a right-winger government ruling now, and they have cut the education fees of the, the subventions of educa to education, and that has already has uh, effects of people of people believe on future, for example. So, uh, yes, things are not like perfect at all. But but we have to struggle. We have had a certain level of welfare, and now they are degrading it. That's my feeling. As I said, I'm not, I'm not at all interested in politics, so uh, I'm talking on a very loose ground here. But, um, uh, but yes, I, I think that in Norway too, uh, change, uh, I mean, political, dif the differences between people are getting stronger, the welfare state is, is really a thing that is 
you, have st you really have to fight for it, to, f to fight for this feeling that in a way that we at least have in Norway, this we, we are a people, we are together, we can do this. And that includes w women and men and kind of all of us. And I think that it sounds naive, but it's, there is something in it and that is really beautiful. Um, but there is something else that I really don't really understand that I find is very interesting and that is this new Me Too uh, uh, thing that, especially in Norway, uh, young women has fronted. And I find that a bit, I mean, I find that through, truly interesting and a bit, uh, a bit. I'm also a bit uneasy about it because uh, Yes, of course, sexual harassment should not take place. And it's very, you know, it's good that that kind of comes out and is being stated. But then there is all this kind of gray zones uh, that I think is kind of, we have to go into that. I don't know if this enters this discussion. I just want to pull it out because, because I think this is kind of the young women's entrance. And, they, and I think... Uh, uh, we have a poet in Norway who was active in the 70s against a bit the feminists because she was kind of problematic. Eldred Lunden is her name. She was kind of problematizing the language the feminists uses. And she's, uh, and she's, one of the things she said is that if you want to be a victim, just say that you are a victim and then you become a victim. So, I mean, so what you say becomes the reality, and then we have to say something else. And we are the one, in, in, I mean, to, we are the one to do that. We have the power to do that. And we, sh I mean, and then it's the choice. What do I say about myself? What do you say about yourself? What, what is the truth about our, what we are living? And I really, I just wanted to pop this up because I, I find this kind of, this Me Too is also a way of kind of victimizing women uh, also. So I guess we will have a heated debate afterwards. Martin, you want to yeah, jump sure. into that debate? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think... I think Speak there's closer to the microphone. I think it's, there's definitely a backlash happening uh, in Scandinavia, in Europe, uh, that has parallels to the US as well. Um, the, there's a Canadian um, anti-feminist, I guess you could call him, Jordan Peterson. Um, he's, uh, he just uh, visited Sweden, right? And, and uh, there was massive enthusiasm for his, for his message. Um, and I think it, that sort of speaks to, to you know, it felt like you know, Bruce Springsteen is really big in, in Sweden. When he comes, the whole country stops for a moment and, and, and everything, you know, everyone has to have an opinion about the, the concert. And that was sort of what happened when Jordan Peterson arrived. And I think that speaks to a kind of um, male uh, uh, longing for, um, a, you know, an anti-feminist narrative. And um, I think social media has also been very crucial in, in establishing that. Um, uh, you know, there's this, there's this um, on social media you tend to have the, the um, um, you know, loudest voices being being heard, and and um, women are very typically harassed a lot in social media as well. And I think you have, after a few years, uh, created this sort of organized movement of anti-feminism um, on social media, um, and it's you know it speaks to its uh, sort of international uh, phenomenon where where. Um, men think that feminism has gone too far somehow, you know. Yes, uh, since we are on this topic, uh, when I, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the important steps that have made the uh, changes that have taken place the last decades, if I look at that, when I was growing up in the 60s, the society was totally male-dominated. All the politicians were, were men. Men were uh, uh, working, but uh, the, the women, they were uh, staying in, the, in their homes, taking care of children and, and so on. 
and this has totally changed in about uh, the last 40 years or so. The most important steps when uh, looking at my own society was uh, like uh, uh, we have a, uh, always have a president in our country and they were always men but in 1980 a, a, a woman, a single mother was uh, elected the president and uh, looking back it was, there was a, shown a clip from the de debate between the presidential candidates for the uh, 1980s election, and uh, uh, her uh, uh, biggest opponent said, because she was a single mother, he said the sentence, I think the president of Iceland should always have a good wife on his side. So this, this is, uh, nobody laughed in 1980, but nowadays when this was shown, there was a general la laughter all, all around the country. Then. Uh, uh, a few years later, uh, the lead, uh, a, a woman was elected the mayor of Reykjavik and she, she uh, uh, imposed uh, or uh, uh, secured that every uh, uh, child should have uh, access to daycare all day from morning till, uh, till uh, after work. Then uh, there were things like uh, this, uh, uh, what is called paternal leave, yeah. uh, equal. Uh, first, when I, I heard of this, I thought that this was ridiculous. Why should a man have, uh, have to uh, rest after, after giving birth? But this, of course, uh, did the change that uh, before this, women were uh, uh, less valued as, as uh, uh, on, on the, uh, uh, as, as, uh, yeah, they were le less likely to be employed because uh, they were young women were supposed to be on a parental leave every second year, the next years to come, but now it's uh, the, the both. So uh, what has changed is that now the uh, majority of, of leading politicians, like at the parliament, are, uh, are female. The majority of uh, those who graduate from universities are also female. And uh, uh, so there is still on, on some fields that uh, we can say male domination, like maybe uh, uh, big finance and so on. You were, well, uh, all, all the men in their uh, suits come to uh, decide how to spend uh, the big money. But uh, this, this is what has happened. I think this, these are the uh, most important steps as I see it. Thank you. Laura. Yes, there are very many women in universities, for example, and graduated and doctorated and etc. But there is a glass ceiling still existing in Finland, I believe in other countries too, that they're, for example, in a good position of power in the companies and so on, the majority is men. But one, I, one thing I want to point out is about how you make politics. And for example, I mentioned this um, uh, sexual harassment legislation and sexual violence and uh, uh, power, people in power haven't been very much interested about that we should make it to a consent question, not a violence question, until just about two, three weeks ago, there was a thing happened in northern part of Finland called Oulu. And uh, there were sexual abuse on children, like five cases, and uh, the suspected are foreigners. Uh, refugees, some of them, some of not. And after that, it came out. It was so big media thing in Finland. Everybody talked to it, and tr uh, the government and other politics started to make politics about it. So uh, it's there is uh, over thousand uh, accusations on sexual violence toward children per year, apparently something like that. And now we needed some foreigners that we started to really be uh, concerned about it. And I really hate that kind of politic making. Anne. 
I just want to share two things. Um, first, it's just a thought or an image. Uh, I arrived um, last Monday to Delhi and I had some hours on my own before the rest of my Norwegian group came and, uh, and I went out in the street. I'd never been to Delhi before. And outside the hotel the, there was this tuk-tuk driver, Sharma. And he wanted to, drive, to give me a lift somewhere. And I wanted to walk because I'd been in the plane for two, 15 hours. And, and, uh, and the story went on and I ended up in Sharma's tuk-tuk. And, and we drove off and, 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 and we became friends. And we stayed together for three hours and he took me around and showed me. And then finally we went to have lunch at his fast food place where he went with his fellow tuk-tuk drivers. And it's, it was only there that I realized that there are no, there, there, was, there were no women. It, I was the only one. I was the foreigner. And then at this fast food place, there were only men serving and only men eating. And I could see there was no woman around. So, and that was kind of, where am I? I just, I just wanted to hand out that image because I, to me that was really interesting. And, and it shows that there are so much I don't know about your society. And it also makes me a little bit feel like a fool sitting here to talk about gender equality in Scandinavia. Because it feels like the difference is so big that I don't really know what I'm talking about to you. Because I don't know where you are, in a way. So that was one thing. And then I wanted just to talk, because I have said over and over that I'm not interested in politics. And I don't even know much about politics. So I'm not... Uh, but I think that the personal is political, as we have said since the 70s. And that's, that's where this novel, Love, starts. And I just want to say a few things uh, uh, about this novel, because... This novel, which is called Love, takes place a winter night, uh, winter night, evening and into the night, and there are two protagonists. It's this woman, Vibeke, which is a single mother uh, in the very north of Norway. It's snow, it's cold, uh, and she has this son, Jon, who is going, it's, it's his birthday the day after, and he is going to be nine years old. And he is really looking forward to his birthday, because then finally he can you know, imagine that there will be a cake, there will be something for him. Uh, and during this novel, the, the ways of the mother and the son, they go, they go separate ways during the night. And the novel follows each of them, so the reader always know where they are, but they don't know where the other one is. And, 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 and during this novel, you understand that Vibeke, the mother, has forgotten about his birthday. Or at least she doesn't think about it in what that is written in the novel. And if you read the novel, uh, at least in Norway, one of the questions I always get is, is she a bad mother? And what is it to be a mother? And what is love? Um, uh, yes, and that was kind of the other thing I wanted to just to throw out that in a way this novel in Norway has been kind of one of the novels that is you come back to it when you talk about uh, when you talk about being a woman and, 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 and being a mother and all these stereotypes that all I mean what is what is love what is good what is bad what what do you really I don't really it's also this being a mother that's kind of a really big kind of clunch of, of expectation that, I mean, it's, it's, may, it's maybe the one most wonderful thing you can be is to be a mother, but it's also, I mean, the society has a lot of expectations. So this is, I don't know where to end. Cut yeah, me off. Yeah, I'll help, I'll help you out. Uh, no, but I think that's, uh, that's an important, just thinking about motherhood and thinking about the uh, women in my own, in fam my own family in, in previous generations and what motherhood uh, and the expectations around motherhood m meant for them. And that makes me think about the fact, maybe the, uh, I guess the title of this um, seminar, which is um, Gender Equality and the Welfare State, because I do think that for, 
for women to even start thinking about liberty and freedom and how to define themselves as mother and what choices to make, there has to be, cho there has to be a freedom to choose. And only, and I think uh, it's hard to avoid uh, thinking about uh, the, the welfare state when creating uh, freedom for, for, for not only for the elite, but for like br the broad uh, masses of, of, of women. And um, so I think going back to the political struggle and going back to the, um, uh, to the last century in Scandinavia, really how women fought for, um, for daycare, how women fought for uh, non-discrimination in the workplace, how women fought for um, the right to education and so forth. I mean, it doesn't solve the problems that we talk about, how it, what it is to be a mother, but it at least gives um, a, a larger number of women the freedom to think about choices. And that's, uh, I think that's, um, I don't know, to your point. I just wanted to add something on also on the Me Too discussion and how it kind of translates into policy, at least in Sweden. And actually this last fall, we had a change in the uh, rape uh, laws um, in Sweden and now it's consent based uh, so the assumption is that there has to be consent between a m woman and, and a man and um, so, so the, uh, the burden of evidence kind of shifts uh, it, it, the, the lawmakers don't assume that there is consent you have to actually be able to uh, well, it's always hard to prove when, there, when it's a situation between two people, but at least the, the presumption has shifted in, uh, in, the legal, in the legal system. And that's a pretty big shift in terms of how we think about sexuality and how we think about the intimate relationships uh, and power um, relationships between uh, men and, and women, I think. So just to uh, an earlier point about Me Too. D did you want to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, uh, Laura, and, and, uh, last point and then we will open up for uh, questions from the audience. Okay, uh, about a uh, gender question, there is one thing in Finland which is compulsory sterilization and it's done to people of transgender if they want to have uh, the right identity number and that is very huge problem. It doesn't concern everybody, but it's a mark of inequality. And for example, in India, I have understood that you have kind of acknowledged the third gender, which I think it's very revolutionary and good thing. So thank you for that. Thank you. And do we have any uh, questions from the room? Please wave anything. Gender equality, motherhood, welfare state. Yes, please. Sorry. This question of transgender. Okay. The question of transgender. Are they born that way or do they choose to become that way? Transgender, do, are they born that way or do they? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to? Um, I think the, yeah, I, th we don't want it's too large an issue to get into here, I, I think. Uh, I, I would say, I, I'm not a specialist on this subject, of course, but I would say that there are so many different ways of being a transgender person that it's not a very good idea to try to say where it comes from or something, and it's uh, not the subject of our discussion today. Hi. So, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to discuss something is where you pointed out that after you got your first female president, um, there was uh, increase in representation also following which I wanted to discuss uh, female leaders and empathy. And do female leaders have more empathy than male counterparts? Is that a question or? Yeah, it's a uh, question. Or, 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 or do you think that that is the case? Or is, do, you, do you want to know what we think about it? Yes, yes. Um, I, do, do women leaders have more empathy in, in general than, than men? Any perspective on that? Um, 
Well, to be honest, I don't think that comes like biologically. I think women and men are raised differently, and I think that empathy becomes a way that women can gain love. But I think I think that is not you're not sure to have an empathic leader if she's a woman. But but I think as females we are more kind of when we grow up we are more rewarded to be empathic empathetic while males are tend to be more rewarded to be competitive or high I know things like that so there is a one trend word everybody speaking on toxic masculinity and this has something to do with this question I think also, uh, just to add a perspective to that, that maybe, you know, if you are the norm, you never have to question who you are and who you're, what your identity is. And if you're a woman, you're not part of the norm. Then, so then you, al you always need to think about who you are in, relations, in relationship to society, to other people. And sometimes I think that that situation creates, a, a, I mean, it gives you, it gives you something also, empathy, imagination maybe, and that uh, it's easier for you to empathize with with other people in, uh, who, who are not either uh, the norm. So that's my take. Uh, Karen, uh, you mentioned that there was a whole range of uh, uh, activism and politics and, and a whole series of things that led to uh, many Scandinavian countries rapidly transforming into you know, gender equitable societies today. Uh, could anyone give us an example of say, uh, how, how parental leave or, or policies for uh, mothers, you know, what kind of activism brought that about? A any, any what, one kind of you? what kind of activism? Yeah, any yeah. one example? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the fight for universal daycare, for example, in, in Sweden, it was really a, a demand from, from the women's movement. And there was a really big struggle within uh, the Social Democratic Party that was then the ruling party in Sweden and there was massive resistance, really, really massive, <laughs> massive resistance from men who wanted to spend the money on industrial policies or, you know, what have you. Um, uh, so it was really, uh, and I think the, the, the key to success was, was that these women organized both uh, as activists and within the parties. So they they would work on public opinion kind of on the side in independent movements, but also had very strong representation uh, in the Social Democratic Party and in the Liberal Party. So it was the combination, I think, of... I think if they had only been trying to get these measures through in the parliamentary system or in the po political parties, it would never have happened because the resistance was so so big. So they had to do it also kind of uh, as activists on the, on the side. So, yeah. Um, so, in response to uh, your points about feminist language and how it can be problematic, and also this phenomenon of Jordan Peterson and his following, yeah. um, I think uh, a, a lot of uh, that conversation is about victimhood. It's and about victim victimhood. And I think there's like two ways of victim, as far as I can see, there are two discourses around victimhood. Uh, one is just the factual victim, somebody who was systemically just a victim, but uh, they don't feel like a victim. Uh, and then there is the emotional shame of a victim that we often put on someone or that is um, projected on someone. And um, I wonder as writers, as intelligentsia, or, or as anyone trying to be an activist in any way, what we can do to create these distinctions between this emotional victim and um, someone who is a systemic victim but who you know, and, and how both can have their dignity. And because very often this thing that we say, um, the personal is the political, um, sometimes that works against us uh, because sometimes the personal is the personal. We aren't looking to politicize it, but it, in some contexts, it's become political automatically. So any comments on that? Sorry, that wasn't very well phrased. But no, it's an interesting question. Anybody? Martin, I see you. Yeah, I think I think I, I, if I understood the the, the question, uh, uh, I think um, uh, part of it is, you know, men have sort of appropriated the narrative of oppression, right, from groups who are actually oppressed, um, to sort of try to turn it against uh, feminists, for example, and. Uh, 
I think that's uh, you know has been a very efficient tactic for 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 sort of organized anti-feminist uh, in in America. There is a sort of informal movement called the men's rights movement, and they believe that since the 70s, basically the power dynamic in America has shifted, and now the men are, are oppressed by by women. Um, and you know their logic is is obviously uh, a bit challenged by facts, but but uh, but um, you know it's. But I think I think we also need to sort of, you know, it's easy to sort of laugh at the the absurdity of a lot of these claims. But I think it's also important to sort of understand where the where the need comes from for this uh, type of leaders. Um, you know, I think I think it's so central to 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 the new sort of uh, the, the anti-feminist backlash and the and the nativist backlash, very closely correlated. I think in 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 a fear of powerful women and in, in, in a in a fear of of um, men losing um, their their place in the hierarchy. Laura, yes, uh, the social media has changed a lot in Finland too, because there is now a lot of hate speech which comes mostly through social media and it's very much against women who raise up their voice and tell, uh, do politics or, or raise up things like sexual harassment and so on, and they are getting treated uh, by violence or rape, <laughs> which is ridiculous. So um, this is something that that is very different for men if you are active in society and to women who are active in society. We must kind of take much more in and try to survive in this situation. And it's sometimes really dangerous because they can kind of mobilize people who are ready to hurt you. So it's not just a, like a question of how you behave, but it's a question of safety as well. Um. I will go on another level to try to answer your question. I think all these levels are interesting and are important, and I think that's also why this question is is so is so dense, it's so complex, and we need to be present in all of them. And I want to raise uh, what I heard in your question was also this kind of how can we how can we unshame the victimhood, and I. That can, of course, be done on a on a structural level uh, by, uh, like Laura said, this law in Sweden about rape. So the so the structure can kind of really put put the the uh, the, the weight of of guilt on another place. But then I think that I'm always getting back to the, to the personal existential level. Uh, it's, also, um, it's also a work we have to do with ourselves, I think. And I think it's always important to remember all these levels at the same time. Yes, I'm a part of a system, huh? but I am also kind of... Uh, it's, uh, what am I really? What do I want to be? Do I want to be a victim? Mean, of course, this sounds easy. It's not, but I think. But I think that, and I also think that literature can be part of this uh, this way of loosing up the the, the weight of uh, of um, uh, dooming uh, and the weight of, weight of shaming. Because literature can give you another per perspective. You can read you, you, you can read books on the topic that can kind of help you in a, in a very deep, in a way, shift. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm not a victim. Maybe I can see this in that way. Maybe, maybe, maybe that there is another position to take that can you can open a little inner emotional window to to a more dignified place in yourself. And I, literature can do that. I think also. I think one more uh, question, or maybe two quick ones. Uh, the the man in the. Uh, hello. Yes, uh, I would like oh, to ask. Okay, hi. Hello, my name is Alina, and I would like to ask: How is the narrative of Me Too victimizing when it's all about holding your, uh, your harasser accountable, and it's super empowering because you're fighting back? So, how is it that you say that it's uh, victimizing? I 
I'm, I'm not talking about the very, you know, the very obvious cases, but in all where we have kind of, I think we must also be willing to see that, I mean, in a lot of situations, the women is kind of also making choices in these situations. And of course, I'm, I'm not talking about, the, I'm, I'm here, I'm trying to open a more kind of, uh, how do you say it, a more, um, nuanced uh, picture to say that on the outline, I mean, Jesus, there is harassment. That's done deal. But then there are all these gray situations, and I think that it's very important that that is also that is is also part of of my my responsibility as a woman. What I mean, if I gain something of a situation, if I if I want to sleep with that director to have I mean to have a part in the play, that is also a choice I do. It's not only a system that I walk into. I mean, that's also a choice I do. That's also kind of a choice, and I have to face that. Of course, they make a difference, but that is not the whole of it. You can't, and that is what uh, that is where I think that we have to talk about victimizing yourself. Oh, I'm a victim. You're not only a victim. You made a choice. I mean, of course, these things are very nuanced. But I think I, I will not kind of I would not be part of those who kind of say that oh, poor you only. Of course, but this is very nuanced, and I know that I'm working. I'm working directly into a burning hole here, so. Okay, one, uh, yes, one, last, one last question, yes. My question is to Hane. Uh, looking at uh, motherhood, looking at motherhood from the existential perspective, do you think men ever achieve some sense of motherhood? Achieves a sense of motherhood. Looking at motherhood from the existential perspective, mm -hmm. do you think men ever achieve some sense of motherhood? Oh yes, I do. Uh, should I just repeat the question, or yeah. did it? Uh, 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 can men achieve a sense of motherhood? Looking at motherhood yes. from the existential perspective, do you think men ever yeah. achieve some sense of motherhood? Uh, I would say that you can call it fatherhood, but it's the same thing. <laughs> I do so much agree, and that's also where literature is so interesting. We have a new, uh, we have an author in Norway called Guy Gulix, who just wrote a book, and he is kind of waving out. And it's a very much a book about being a father, and like Einar so beautifully said, I think really it is the same thing. And I, and I also think this kind of gender thing, if you really go to the, if you kind of go below all the structures, I think we are the same. I will never not think that. I think that's a perfect note uh, to end this conversation. Thank you so much to the audience for your great uh, questions and to, the, and to the panel. Thank you very much, Anna Carson, Hannah Ostewick, Laura Lindstedt, Martin Gellin, and Karen Pedersen. The session was sponsored by Nordic Lights. Hannah and Laura are going to sign their books. You can please line up by the book signing area of the bar hall, which is on your left. Thank you.